As promised, here is the second half of the original Mega Blade Runner episode. If you haven't watched yet, go check out the first part in which we broke down Rick Deckard's various outfits from the original movie. This time around, we'll be looking at Officer KD6-3.7, or simply Officer K, and then later on Joe, the main character of the 2017 movie Blade Runner 2049. Released 35 years after the original, this sequel takes place 30 years after the events of the first, Blade Runner 2049 itself is vastly different from the original. Though it still has that iconic Blade Runner look and feel in many aspects, it also deviates and creates a lot of its own too. Though it did a bit better financially and critically during its run in theaters compared to the original, it is often considered a box office failure. This in turn has led it down a similar route in that it has become something of a cult classic to both fans old and new. However, this time around, fans almost instantly hopped onto identifying, sourcing, and recreating various props and costumes from the film with relative ease compared to the first film, which took many people years, if not decades, to decipher. Regarding the actual story, the Tyrell Corporation has been bought out by Wallace Corp, and replicants are no longer banned on Earth. However, older and rogue models, such as the Nexus 8 series, are still an issue that need to be addressed by way of retirement. And so, Blade Runners are still very much needed, which brings us to Officer K. K's outfit is a pretty straightforward one compared to Deckard's. It consists of a coat, sweater, pair of pants, boots, and shoulder holster, with some other smaller accoutrements such as his blaster, wallet, and joy emanator. So let's start at the top with the coat. Throughout the movie, due to things like lighting and color grading, the coat sometimes appears to be made up of a leather that looks either gray, black, or green in color. There are a few issues with this, primarily that in the Blade Runner universe, animal-based clothing is illegal due to a shortage of animals mainly. Yes, things like holsters and belts in the first one sort of slip by, but with this in mind and a few other factors, leather coats are out. Kay's actual coat is a very dark green which borders on gray and is actually made of cotton which was treated with a wax finish to give it that glossy sheen as well as to give it a level of waterproofing. The front closure is secured by a series of internal magnets of all things, with the collar closed by a buckle and strap system. On the back, written vertically, was a series of letters that were darker in appearance. Finally, the inside of the collar area was a bit of dirtied and worn faux fur. For these coats, there are a number of options online, but two of the best ones out there are offered by Big Effect Props on Etsy or through Magnoli. Cheaper options are also out there, such as white sheep leather, along with many others, but remember the same rules apply here as they did for Deckard's coat, as far as vetting the pictures and listings, as they can often not be entirely accurate or simply show pictures from elsewhere. Under the coat, Kay has three different looks while on duty, which utilize two sweaters and one long-sleeved shirt. All were off the shelf and darker in color. The first look, seen really only in the opening scenes of the movie, consists of both sweaters. On top was the rag and bone Avery standard issue, or simply standard. It was seen prominently in the first post-traumatic baseline test and appeared very blue. However, when viewing behind the scenes footage, you can see it was much darker, resulting in the navy colored one being identified as the correct version. To go fully accurate with this one, just note that the collar appears to have been frayed slightly with it being stretched out a little bit as well. Below that, for a time, he wore the second sweater, which was a black Theory Aster. This one was seen being worn either on its own or over the long sleeve after the first baseline test, with the most prominent sighting during the Dynabase machine scene. Both of these are now a bit hard to come across as they are no longer made and the ones that weren't bought by the public were quickly scooped up by collectors. The best bet for this is to periodically check eBay, the RPF, Facebook groups, and any secondhand clothing websites like Poshmark as they occasionally pop up. Alternatively, you can pick up lookalikes as both brands offer the same lines and materials and patterns made of the same colors that are very close in overall look. Since both of these were worn during the Sapper Morton fight, to make them properly accurate, you'll have to just add a small repair on the upper right sleeve from when Kay was stabbed. Looking closer, the actual design of both sweaters gives off an almost honeycomb or cellular structure look that likely plays with the theme of uniformity and being part of a system, as these are seen and mentioned in a variety of ways throughout the movie, such as the baseline test. Do they keep you in a little box? Cells. Cells. Interlinked. Interlinked. What? As well as the honeybees in Las Vegas, and even in things as minute as Kay's boots, which we'll get to shortly. Now, finally, we have the long-sleeved shirt. 
seen being worn under the Aster sweater, and then on its own when Kay is recovering after the fight in which Deckard is apprehended, there isn't a whole lot to use to ID the brand and model. Though the long sleeve appears grey in the scene, it is actually black, and judging by the design, you can go with just about any basic crew neck style shirt. However, if you want to go as accurate as possible, look for one that has more pronounced seam lines along with a thinner collar and cuff endings. Also remember, it appears that the neckline was stretched out a bit, and judging from earlier shots, was slightly frayed as well. Worn over all of these pieces is his shoulder holster. This item is perhaps the most detailed and hard to source aspect of Kay's look. The base component is the Safari Land 1090 Gun Quick Holster. Taking a page from the original movie, the production used the same company, but decided on a more sleek looking design. Again, the base piece was modified, this time giving it a more futuristic look and feel. Stocks of the original holster have dried up, but they do occasionally appear on eBay, However, good places to periodically check are the RPF's Facebook group and website, along with the group replicant, the Blade Runner cosplay group. Moving down, we have his gloves, which are occasionally seen throughout the film. They are a bit tricky and have yet to be fully identified. Speculation has risen that there were more than one pair, were custom made, or were a specific pair of Gaspar gloves, such as the Genial Deluxe, as Ryan Gosling has used them in other movies such as Drive. What is known is that they are black in color and appear to be either made of leather or pleather, the pleather being a possibility since most of the costumes in the movie were made of animal-free materials, again to fit in with the universe where real animals are scarce. Next up are his pants, which are still something of a conundrum. Many think they're a type of straight-fit type pants such as khakis or chinos. Their design is rather simplistic, and that in of itself causes a bit of an issue when trying to identify them. Color-wise, they are also a bit hard to decipher as, much like the coat, they seem to change color scene to scene. The overall consensus regarding the color is that it is a sort of lightish brown shade that often appears green. Most of the time, companies seem to refer to this color as either forest, army, olive, or something along those lines. Scrutinizing the seams, stitches, pockets, and other minute factors of the pants, along with the fact that most of the other clothing was off the shelf, and even, in the instance of the first sweater, sourced by the same company, our best guess for the make of the pants is Rag & Bones Mid-Rise Chino's standard issue in the color army. They sell three styles, but the closest appears to be the Fit 2 version. However, you can go with a few other options out there which are far cheaper and close in the overall look, a few links of which can be found in the description. Finally, we have the boots, which were black bait strike 8 inch side zips. These are still available to buy commercially and can be easily found on sites like Amazon or through Bates' website directly. To make it properly accurate, you'll have to remove the whole front logo off the tongues, leaving just the cellular weave on it, as well as blacking out the blue Bates lettering on the Velcro flaps. As mentioned earlier, the boots sport a very unique design, similar to the sweaters, which was likely an intentional decision on the production team's part. Now, with his primary wardrobe out of the way, we can start looking at some of the finer elements. First up is the wallet, which is not so much a wallet this time around, but rather a badge and ID case. But where it differs in look and function when lined up against Deckard's, it mirrors it as far as giving problems to the people who have tried to replicate and reproduce it. Being that it's only seen briefly and not very well in the movie doesn't give people much to work with. The book, The Art and Soul of Blade Runner 2049, does showcase it a little better, though it still leaves much to be desired. From what can be gathered, there are three elements. The wallet itself is a bifold design, the ID is backlit, and the badge is based on a more traditional real-world metal LAPD one as opposed to the slightly more simplified ones seen in the original movie. Regarding the bifold, these are easy to obtain in their own right, but getting one with a proper plastic and setup is another story. If you want to do it yourself, you'll need to get a bifold ID and badge case. These can be found relatively easy, though a good brand to go with is Cobra Toughskin, in this case their CT14 model. You'll have to remove the inside protector flap and cut the recessed area to accommodate whichever badge you end up going with. Lastly, you'll need to get some good flexible plastic that's the right size, then cut it down and wrap it around the whole thing. Securing it can be done a few different ways, but one of the easiest is to insert it into each side slots, then let friction hold it in place. Alternatively, there are a few sellers who make custom fully finished ones on Etsy, one of the best being the store run by Pew Pew Crafts. They offer the wallet, ID, and badge. That brings us to the second element, the backlit ID. The card itself doesn't see much variation between versions offered, but rather the challenging part is having it light up. 
Many sellers offer these cards either semi-transparent or fully opaque. The version you go with will depend on whether you plan to try and backlight it or not. In the description, you can find a link to an RPF thread in which users talk about numerous ways they tried to light it up, such as with mini LEDs, fairy string lights, EL board and tape, and old cell phone screens, to name a few. The big issue is trying to incorporate the power supply into the wallet itself. Now, regarding the actual badges, there are quite a few versions out there which can cause a bit of a headache when figuring out which to go with. When looking at the art book again, you can see a badge of a police officer which is designed in the same manner as K's. Though it does showcase it on a more detailed scale, it is still a bit small to see some of the finer aspects of things like the city's crest. Between that, displays seen at San Diego Comic Con in 2017, as well as home release launch parties, the badges have popped up a few times, giving way to quite a few interpretations by a variety of sellers. When searching, you'll want to look for a few specific aspects, which are the font type, the white circle around the seal, and the lettering at the bottom. Right now, easily accessible ones usually have one or two of those three aspects, so choosing one will ultimately come down to preference. Here are a few of those side by side, and you can clearly see some are greatly different, while others see only subtle changes. One run that was done by an RPF user by the name of Gordon Gecko was said to be the most accurate to date. However, being that it was limited, their availability isn't widespread, though they do pop up from time to time. Okay, now we have the Joy Emanator. Bought by K so Joy can go with him anywhere, this device was a rectangular shaped rod that extended from the middle. There are a number of 3D printed and resin kits that can be bought raw or finished online, which are usually retractable and can accommodate the LED light as well. Next up is the portable Voight Kampf test device seen during the Sapper Morton fight. These were spring activated, sporting what looks like a series of LEDs as well as a large side screen. Though there have been a few attempts to replicate the hero version of it on a large scale for enthusiasts none, as of yet, have come to fruition, though there is one promising one as of October 2020. RPF user Joa Trash FX is in the process of developing a functional version that would be close to the hero one seen during the scene. Link to his thread about it can be found below. For the time being, your best bet is to just get a 3D file and print it as a static prop. From there, you can probably fit LED lights and whatever else. This brings us to the wooden horse carving K finds at the orphanage. There are quite a number of options online, ranging from 3D printed to resin with even a few actually made of wood. Many vary slightly as they're modeled or made slightly different from one another, so keep that in mind. The most accurate one is from the company NECA, which cast theirs from one of the original screen used ones. And last but not least, we have Officer K's Blaster. Like Deckard's, it has no official name, but is referred to as the LAPD 2049 Blaster. Unlike Deckard's though, which used real-world firearm parts, this one was completely fabricated from scratch. There are quite a few options out there where you can 3D print, buy resin or printed kits, and judging by a project run, even all metal ones at some point likely in the near future. Whether it's a stunt static one or a moving hero one, preference as to which to go with ultimately boils down to your budget. And with that, we can retire from this two-part series on Blade Runner. Like the first, here are a few of the websites and sources mentioned throughout this video. We have the Replica Prop Forums website and Facebook group, which are always the first place to check out when working on just about anything prop and or costume related. There's also Prop Summit, which is a giant forum dedicated to the props and costumes of Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049 to an extent. Replicant, the Blade Runner costuming group on Facebook, which is a very small but helpful community of builders for Deckard, Kay, and various other characters. Be sure to check out their albums filled with character reference photos. And finally is the book, The Art and Soul of Blade Runner 2049 by Tanya Lapont, which covers various aspects of the film from writing to character development, and of course the production design. Likely destined to become another highly influential movie in its own right, this movie has both made a name for itself by way of its own story, as well as by fleshing out and opening the doors for future tales set in the Blade Runner universe. Though still relatively new compared to the 1982 original, 2049 has steadily been gaining momentum in the costuming and prop world, and we hope this video, along with the first part, did the movies and the fan base justice as far as trying to break down and convey the ins and outs when trying to put together the looks of these two iconic characters. If you found this or Deckard's video informative and entertaining, why not subscribe for more? Among our history videos, we do uniforms and costume videos too, from all sorts of movies, TV shows, and video games. If not, you're probably a replicant, which is fine, but just check back soon for more videos right here on Uniform History.